We are continuing our series on David today, and we're going to fast forward into his life. Uh, Pastor Steve uh, started this series out so uh, incredibly uh, well, and so like, let's go get it with David and Goliath and how we're not the underdogs. And then uh, last weekend, Pastor Michael preached here, and campus pastors at every campus uh, did a great job of continuing and talking about a different piece of the story of David. And so now we're going to fast forward a little bit more, uh, and, and, and we're going to pick it up at a, a story that David's already king. He's fought a lot of battles. He's, he's been uh, battle tested. He's been going. And now he's king. And we're going to pick up this story in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite, Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Reba. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So I want us to see something in verse one right there. It said it was the time when kings, David being king, normally go out to war. And then at the, at the end there of, of that, it says, however, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. I want us to see, David was the king of Israel. He was anointed king. He was called to be the king. He was created for that role in that moment. But David did something pivotal here. He compromised who he was. Kings are supposed to be in war. He, he made a compromise and did not go to war. You know, in life and relationships and different stuff, people talk about compromise all the time. Right, because compromise is everybody trying to find a win-win and all of that, but really what happens when everyone is forced to compromise in everything, nobody really wins because everybody's accepting less than what they should be getting. You're like, wait, what? Right, and compromise, it sounds good, but it's, especially in our principles and our faith and who we are, it's a horrible thing. Because what happens is once you compromise, it's now easier to compromise something else and then something else and then something else because we're giving away who we are called to be, right? And I was thinking about like relationships and compromise and in a funny way, uh, like when a man and a woman are going out to eat, right, the conversation of where do you want to eat happens. And men always say, hey, where do you want to go to eat? And the lady typically always says, I don't know, what do you want? And then the man picks something. And then the lady knows she doesn't want that. She didn't know what she wanted, but she knows she doesn't want what he just picked. Then he's like, okay, what about this? And then she says, I don't want that. I found that I think ladies have a hard time choosing because the first time they got to pick, they doomed all of humanity when they ate the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, that really did happen, but I'm kidding. <laughs> Adam should have done what men should do. We're just going to go here. I'm not even going to ask the question. We're just going to go here. <laughs> I just got an amen. Appreciate that amen right there. I'm, that was a joke. I'm trying to make you laugh. You seemed a little tired this morning. <laughs> had a little fun last night. I get it. Now we're at church, okay. <laughs> so I want us to see, this is the beginning of a situation that David got himself into. The devil didn't get him into it. Nobody forced him into it. But he started something that happened because he compromised who he was. He compromised his role. He compromised who God had created and anointed him to be. He made a compromise, right? And, and when that happens, Right, a, a good definition for compromise is accepting standards that are lower than desirable. Another de dictionary definition was to make a shameful or disreputable concession. See, God has created us and given us gifts and talents and skills and when we've come into the family of Jesus, right, there's a standard. God's standards don't change. 
Because if they did, then it would always be a moving target. Our lives, a lot of times, the reason some of us are always just all over the place is because we're living with a a moving target because we haven't settled the debate in our heart that the standards of the word of God are gonna be the standards over my life and I'm not going to compromise those regardless of what anybody else wants, regardless of how I feel because sometimes we we change and compromise our stances and our standards because we don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings. The problem is I would love to hurt their feelings if it gets them out of hell because if I'm too worried about their feelings then I'm basically just wanting them to go to hell it's like with little kids it's not good for them to only eat candy but if they have a preference they want only candy and if we're going to be decent parents I'm not saying great because we're, none of us are Jesus right but if we're going to be decent we know I got to give them some actual food not just candy And I would really actually hate them if I didn't actually feed them something real. Oh, but I love them. You love them so much you're destroying their body. I'm just trying to make sense of this. But we can never compromise the standards. We actually have to protect the standards in our lives. Because David didn't protect the standard in this moment. He had a moment of weakness. Maybe he was tired. He was worn out. He's, he's been king for a while. He's, he's gone through battle after battle after battle. David said, I just need to rest. And you know what I found is when we get weary and we get worn out is when we actually end up compromising our standards. So we have to be in a place and the only way to, to not get weary and worn out is to spend time with Jesus. It's not a vacation because that's an American thing too. We're always looking forward to vacation. You know what I found? Every time I've gone on a vacation, which I don't do much, I come back and I'm more tired than I was when I left and the work piled up and I'm not relaxed at all. Because that wasn't a biblical idea. Let me explain. Oh, I know, I know. But my vacation, that's great. Take your vacations. But that wasn't a biblical idea. Bible actually says we should work six days. I know. Some of y'all, especially the younger ones in the room, you're like, I ain't working more than two. I get it. I get it. All the boomers in the room are like, yeah, these young people have no work ethic. (laughs) Did someone just clap? (laughs) The whole vacation to relax is an an American concept. And and you say, well, how do you know? Because David was on vacation from doing what he was supposed to be doing. That's not what refreshes us and recharges us. Now me, my ideal vacation, I like beaches, so I want to be at the beach. I get in the ocean, I'm like a little fish, man, I'll just stand there all day and start matching them. I'll look like a lobster because I'm white, right? So they're just like burning and, and I forget that I should reapply sunscreen. I remember the first time as my kids, you know, because my kids are half white and half Hispanic and so like, but they're like fairly light complected. And I remember at one point my wife was we took him to the pool. She didn't put sunscreen on. She's like, I've never had this issue. <laughs> You're welcome. It's like, you didn't put sunscreen on them? No. I'm like, oh, they're white. You gotta. Like, <laughs> they, might, they might tan a little bit, but first they're going to get bright red. <laughs> then they'll get a little bit darker. Okay. But what we see here is that David compromised. And here's what happens when we compromise. What we're basically saying is here's my standard and there is your standard. And then we have to move our standards until we meet somebody else's standards in the middle. And I don't know about you, but it's much better to live life to my standards. And if something is less than the standards that God has placed inside of me, I do not want to compromise those to appease anyone else. We either all get on God's standard or you don't and I'm going to. I'm not gonna sacrifice God's standards in my life to make you happy because my job in life is not to make you happy. If you're unhappy, that's your problem. Ain't my fault. If you don't like yourself, that's not my fault. that's, That's your fault. Nobody else in the world is responsible for you except for you. Yeah, but my dad, my mom, fantastic. Now you're a grown-up. 
those of you that were here Wednesday, you're like, well, Stevie can really speak to this. Now that you're a grown-up, it's time to be a grown-up. Some of us are 70, 80 years old, and we still haven't grown up out of some things because we've compromised so much. You know what one compromise I have is? I'm not a victim, I'm a victor. Why? Because that's a biblical standard. You know how to identify a victim when something goes wrong? Their first thing is to always try to find out who did it, like who did it. In your jobs, we're always trying to assert blame. That's a victim mentality. Instead of just owning it and fixing it. Right, like I've had people work with me that all they want to do is call me and tell me what everybody else is doing wrong. And I'm like, and they're like, I just wanted to make you aware, Pastor. How about if you're aware, you do the right thing and go be a part of fixing it or the solution instead of being a tattletale? I don't know about you, but my parents taught me not to be a tattletale. I know society now is like tell on everyone. It's all the crazy liberal stuff that's like, like it started in airports, right? If you see something, say something. I'm like, that is not my business. Now, if someone comes in terrorist-like, that's my business. But now they're being a little weird. So are you. Like, that, that, they've taught us to tattle on each other. Our phones probably just tattle on us anyway because I think they listen to us. The experts that I know on these things swear they don't listen to us, but I'm like, oh, man, I think they do. I was talking about um, some clothes with someone the other day, and I, all of a sudden my Instagram ads were all that. I was like, how did that happen? They're listening. <laughs> but what happens when we start compromising is that now our standards are fluid and movable. And they're no longer standards. And if your standards are fluid or movable, they're not truly standards. Because when it comes to compromise, here's what happens. Compromise always opens the door for more compromise. Compromise always calls for more compromise. The compromise itself calls for you to compromise. This is what it does. It creates a snowball of compromising. It begins to change and deteriorate who we are and what God created us to do. It's like in America today. We're constantly compromising the standards. And look at the just ridiculousness of gender ideology and all of this dumb demonic stuff you know why because we compromised our standards you know why because the people of God have been asleep like when I was in Dallas it was frustrating to me because they were like free and all that but they were asleep oh it doesn't impact our community yet but when you're asleep you're compromising who you are because God never told us to go to sleep he told us to be of sober mind be vigilant for our enemy the, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour he never at once said hey just just sit still and and be calm and like it's going to just it'll blow over no he he said the enemy's trying to take ground and then he also says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face right We've, the people of God have to do those things. The people of God have to go after Jesus. We can't sit by and just wait because that's compromising the standard. The standard is not to sit by and wait. The standard is to be aggressive and relentless as we even spoke about Wednesday. What happens is compromise never stops. It starts with something small. Maybe just a little thing that we let slide that ends up snowballing out of control. Remember, once you break your standard, it's then fluid. And once it can move, it, it, is it really a standard anymore? So now let's, 2 Samuel 11, 1, now we're gonna read verse two. So this is after David's first compromise, then this happens. Verse two. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, remember, he's compromised, he shouldn't even be here. He noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm 
pregnant. So David's compromise now led to another moment where he had to decide what the standard was. But because he had allowed the standard to move, this was, a, this was even an option. See, when we live to standards, we eliminate some of the options. When we live to the biblical standards and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, it doesn't leave room for the enemy to tempt us and to come in and us to make poor decisions. And so now, because David compromised and he was where he wasn't supposed to be, right, you tell your kids this, don't be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because, right, it's, you see people get in trouble all the time because they were hanging out with the wrong people at the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, that, that, that saying of show me your friends will show your future is truly few, f- true. What I found out from being a youth pastor um, is it really wasn't as much the parents that decided how those teenagers went. I know we, that sucks, but it's true. I always looked at their friend group and literally, based off who they were hanging around, their life turns out a certain way. I mean, it's so true. Think about you. We're, we're a product of the people we're around. So if you're a poor student and all you do is hang around with poor students, if all your friends are making D's and F's, guess what you're gonna make? If all your friends are the A students that apply themselves and are working hard, Oh, that's why. Yeah, start hanging out with someone else, young people in the room. If all you do at work is join in on all the complaining and da-da-da-da-da, stop being around those people. Well, they're my coworkers. Well, then figure out a way to not be next to them and listen to it. And when it starts, walk away. But they're gonna think I'm rude. Okay, but you've gotta protect the standard. And the standard is I'm not gonna allow their negativity. I'm not gonna allow what they're saying and what they're doing. Get on me. I don't want that. Like, that's not who I am because that's not God's standard. I'm not someone who's just gonna sit around and complain and whine. The Bible says do everything without grumbling and complaining, right? Like, I'm not gonna do that because we gotta protect the standard. We've gotta make choices to protect the standard because the standard matters than that other person's feelings because that standard is given by God who's the author of heaven who's the author of salvation, that person's feelings are not. Okay. So we see this. David compromised his kingly position, his kingly duties, and it led him to another compromise. He walks out. He sees a hot lady taking a bath. Like a man. You know, I'm always surprised. Men like, I don't see any women. I'm like, okay, whatever. (laughs) I'm sure you don't. (laughs) The lady saw her, especially in church. Like, I can't believe she, she showed up here. I got to protect my man. If you just take care of him, you'll be all right. I don't want him looking at that. Well, then give him something good to look at. <laughs> and if you're upset with that, I don't care about your feelings. David's compromise led to another compromise. It led to him, one of his best friends and his mighty men, seeing his wife and taking her. And then he got her pregnant. He had that moment, I'm pregnant, Uh uh-oh, now what? But again, it, it wasn't that moment that started this whole thing. It was him not doing what he was supposed to be doing because had he been doing that, this moment wouldn't happen. It always happens when we're neglecting our God-given responsibilities. And if we'd stick to our God-given responsibilities, it leaves a lot less room for the enemy to work. See, because if we go to this, oh, he had an affair, he had that, that's, 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 that's not even the root issue. But oftentimes in our society, the, the sins is what we're like, that's the big problem, they're sinning. I'm like, no, 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 that's just the symptom. Because we always like to, we're, we're, that's who we are. We put band-aids on things. We want to fix symptoms. That's why even in healthcare, most things aren't working because they're just treating symptoms and they don't want to find actual cures because if we find actual cures, there's less money in research. We're just trying to fix symptoms all the time instead of fixing the core, which can truly only be fixed by Jesus. So the start of this was his compromise of not going to war. And then it compounds into this situation. And now, again, 2 Samuel 11, verse 6. 
So now she said, I'm pregnant, and this happens. Then David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, which is Bathsheba's husband. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, go on home and relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked him, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, the ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem and that day and the next, and David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So now we see another compromise, right? His goal was, let's bring Uriah home. Let him relax. He'll go sleep with his wife. Oh, she's pregnant. It's your baby. Trying to get a, like a, you know, Bible Times Maury show going on. <laughs> they didn't have all them DNA tests back then. He'd be like, that's got to be yours, Uriah. I mean, it looks just like David, but that's got to be yours. Like, <laughs> there was no one going to come out. You are not the father, right? Like, th this is it. So now he's trying to even make somebody. See, our compromise leads others and us pressuring others to compromise as well. But here's what's crazy. He didn't protect the standard, but Uriah did. Uriah was a man who protected the standard. Even when his boss was telling him to shift the standard and change the standard, he said, no, this is my standard. So even if we're feeling pressure from others to change the standard, when we're men and women of God, we say, no, I'm not changing my standard to appease anyone else. So he says, hey, go, why didn't you go home and relax? Like, that was his thought. He'd go home, he'd get relaxed, blow off some steam, he'd be great. And your eyes said, nah, man, the men of God and the army of the Lord with the ark are sleeping in tents. How could I go home and enjoy that while all of them are out there suffering and fighting? And then it got so bad, David, David brings him over and gets him drunk. He was trying to put those beer goggles on him. Like, he's not going to make a good decision now. He's going to go home. And, he's gonna, and he still didn't do it. Even after he got him drunk, he, he still slept with the palace guard. We see this snowballing effect, right, of compromise that happens. We compromise our first thing, and then it's so easy to continue to compromise as we move forward because there is no such thing. So don't ever believe this lie. Oh, this is a one-time compromise. That is the lie of the devil because the one-time compromise leads to second, third, fourth, and then who knows how much compromise we get. So now, more compromise, 2 Samuel 11, verse 14. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. I mean, look at this compromise. He writes this letter and gives it to the guy that he's gonna have killed and sends him with the letter knowing that that guy is so principled and living on standard, he's not going to open it and read it. See what compromise does in our lives? It starts to snowball. It says, put him where it's the strongest so that he'll be killed, verse 16. So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. Then Joab sent a battle report to David. He told his messenger, report all the news of the battle to the king. But he might get angry and ask, why did the troops go so close to the city? Didn't they know they would be shooting from the walls? Wasn't Abimelech son of Gideon killed at Thebes by a woman who threw a millstone down on him from the wall? Why would you get so close to the wall? Then tell him, Uriah the Hittite was killed too. So the messenger went to Jerusalem and gave a complete report to David. The enemy came out against us in the open fields, he said. 
And as we chased them back to the city gate, the archers on the wall shot arrows at us. Some of the king's men were killed, including Uriah the Hittite. Well, tell Joab not to be discouraged, David said. The sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was with, displeased with what David had done. See, so now we have David, the king of Israel. The David who killed Goliath. The David who did all these things. He's now had a situation, a compromise, another compromise, and now he's covering it up with another compromise. And it almost seems like he doesn't really care, right? Verse 25 was like, well, tell Joab not to be discouraged. The sword takes one today, one tomorrow, just fight harder. It's almost like he doesn't even care that he killed one of his best friends or essentially had him killed. Why? Because compromise and when we change our standards, it desensitizes us in our society to, it desensitizes us to the voice of the Lord and the Holy Spirit trying to speak to us. And here's what I know about the Holy Spirit. The more we ignore the Holy Spirit, the less we're gonna hear from the Holy Spirit. You say, yeah, when I started doing this sin, I kind of felt bad and then I kept doing it and now I don't feel as bad anymore. Yeah, because the Holy Spirit's like, they're not listening, so I'm gonna let them do what they're gonna do and hopefully their flesh gets destroyed in that, in that situation and they come back to the saving grace knowledge of Jesus. It's the story of the prodigal son. He wanted his thing, he left, went and got it. Everything fell apart, came back home. Because compromise leads to more compromise. Changing the standard leads to a standard that's not a standard, but it's a moving target and we never hit it. Compromise is actually just a sign that you'll pass on the road to mediocrity. Those who live in compromise are just gonna be mediocre people. God did not create you and I to be mediocre. He created us to be great. And so if we wanna be great, we should never even see a sign of compromise because the road to greatness does not have any compromise on it. It has a vision and a standard and it continues to go after that vision and after that standard regardless of what's going on around it. It keeps going, it keeps moving, it doesn't deter. It might slip and trip and fall but again the, the righteous may fall but they get back up, right? Like they, they, they might have some moments, they might have some obstacles but they never compromise the standard. So why do we compromise? One, we get tired. When we get tired, especially emotionally, we're tempted to cut corners. Right? Anybody in your job, maybe you're, uh, you do something with your hands, you ever cut corners when you're building something and then you regretted cutting the corners? Right? Like it's like, man, if I wouldn't have cut that corner, I, I, right? it happens all the time. When we try to shortcut and take detours and fix some things in a way that's not right. Another example of that is we get busy and we compromise by missing church or stopping serving. Oh, I'm busy. That's a compromise. I know. That one's not fun. Galatians 6, 9, we, we read this Wednesday, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. We will reap a harvest of blessing at just the right time if we don't give up. Another reason we compromise is oftentimes out of fear. David was probably fearful that people would find out what he did. Fear puts us in self-protection mode. You, and maybe this is you. You might be fearful that people might find out what you've done, so the temptation to compromise is covered up. Maybe, maybe you have a fear of rejection, so you're compromised. You're tempted to compromise to fit in. You know, one of the greatest fears in the world is the opinion of others. And the moment that you become unafraid of the crowd, you're no longer a sheep. You actually become a lion. A great roar arises in your heart, and that is the roar of of freedom, and the Bible says that Jesus came to set us free and free indeed. Lions are not concerned with the opinions of sheep. Eagles are not concerned with the opinions of pigeons. When people wanna give me their opinions on my sermons sometimes and stuff, I'm like, that's your opinion and I don't care because I've got to do what I believe God has told me to do. And my, st see, because I heard this, I heard this on a, 
it ticked me off. It was like some pastors talking, and they were talking about how, well, I loosely say the word pastors in this circumstance, but two pastors and kind of a Christian music entertainment guy, which don't even get me started on that world. But they were talking about how pastors need to be aware that in their congregation, there's people who think differently on different things and different topics, and so they need to be sensitive to that. And I wanted to punch him in the face. <laughs> Save not self. Remember, we've talked about it, so get over it. Like, he's violent. I can be if I need to. I'm from Roswell. I'm wearing a 505 shirt, like... Y'all a bunch of crazy people around here. Like, poor Roswell, they're like 5'7", five, 5'9". Five, I'm like, yeah, that stinks. <laughs> anyway, I just, like I was listening to him talk about it. I said, okay, that's, that's great. But that's basically meaning that you're compromising the standard of the word of God to make somebody else's opinion and feeling matter. The reality is if your opinion and your feeling does not match up with the word of God, it's not relevant. It's from the devil. You're saying my feelings don't matter. I know it's 2023 and your feelings really matter. If they don't line up with the word of God, your feelings do not matter. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, it doesn't matter how I feel about it. If it's not the standard of the word of God, my feelings don't matter. But they, they do because they're real. Yeah, and tomorrow your feelings are going to change. And that's going to be real to you too. The only thing real is the standard of the word of God because it's consistent. So we've got we've to not grow weary in well-doing. The way to do that is to stay connected to Jesus. We've also got to not walk in fear. Why? Because the Bible says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. So we have to refuse to walk in fear. Compromise is dangerous territory for Christians. The Bible is the standard and it never changes. It's not fluid. If you keep the word of God where it belongs in your life, you will not compromise because you understand clearly where the standard is. So now you're like, okay, well, I'm gonna close with this. What do I do if I've compromised? David shows us what to do in the next chapter. 2 Samuel 12, verse one. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed. Any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and, Jerusalem and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it discreetly, but I will make this happen to you openly in sight of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you. That's what Jesus offered us on the cross. Is that when we confess our sins to God, I know in church world, it's like, oh, we gotta confess our sins one to another. That's only if I've specifically wronged you and you even know about it. Like, too many times people are like, oh, you need to tell other people. No, you don't need to tell other people because other people don't know how to shut their mouths. Other people are gonna talk about it. You think, oh, they're safe. Yeah, have they ever talked to you about somebody else? Then they're gonna talk about your stuff too. So here's the deal. You go to God 
and confess your sins to God and then he's faithful and just and righteous to forgive those sins. And guess who you don't come to? You don't come to the preacher because even that's unbiblical. Oh, I know, I'm gonna touch on something, but oh, uh, we're, we were taught we're supposed to go to the priest. That's not biblical. Jesus is the high priest and because he came and he lived and he died, I have access to the Father directly through Jesus and the blood that he shed. I don't need a man to repent my sins to and then them to say, oh, go do this and go do that and you'll be forgiven. All you have to do is go to Jesus and say, Father, through the blood of Jesus, I've messed up. I've made a mistake. I'm confessing it to you. I ask for your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. And I repent of my sin. I repent of my wickedness. And guess what? He forgives you. You don't have to go talk to anybody else. You don't have to, oh my gosh, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. I'm like, I can't. When people come confess their sin to me, I'm like, stop. I don't even want to know. That's you and Jesus. I do not want to be involved in your sin. I got enough of my own stuff. I don't want your sin too. Because I don't want to carry that. Go get it right with God. Because too many people, it's like, oh, you need to tell somebody. Maybe you don't, because maybe you telling someone is going to do more harm than it is good. Like, remember the situation there was somebody serving before and someone came and apologized to them because they said that they had prejudged them and basically said, I judged a book by its cover and you're nothing like what I thought you were. Well, you know what that did? The person that was told that came to me and they were like, I don't even know how to process this because I didn't know they had an issue with me by judging a book by its cover and now they're carrying an offense and a hurt that they didn't need to have. So if you feel like you need to go apologize to someone, but they don't even know what you did, stop. You say, but it's going to clear my guilty conscience. That's cute. That's called selfishness. That's going to make you feel better, but now you're going to cause them to hurt and pain and problems. I mean, this, this person was just crying to me. I don't even know what to do. And I'm like, I was so mad. I'm like, why would that person ever go say that to you other than they're actually just sick? It's like they, 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 they and it wants to sound so pious. I was just trying to get it right. You go get it right with God. Your attitude is your problem. It's not that person's. Your judgment of them wasn't their issue. They didn't even know. They could have been blissfully unaware forever. Who cares? Just change the way you in your heart are gonna treat them. I know people are like, oh, I've done that. Yeah, it wasn't right. You caused harm when you didn't need to. Hurt, pain, for no reason. I need us to see that what David did in this is he turned back to God and he repented. So if you've compromised, if I've compromised, we just confess it to God and repent to God. And then he forgives us. See, David didn't have Jesus who came yet. But we have Jesus whose blood covers our transgressions. Whose blood that he didn't compromise the standard and say, oh, we're just gonna shift what sin is so that everybody can just be okay and everyone can make heaven. He kept the standard, but because the standard was too high, he came and he gave his life and died on the cross. Because often, we're gonna miss the standard. Here's what I know, even with this knowledge, we're still gonna compromise sometimes. Our goal is to not compromise, but it's gonna happen at times. Stuff happens, emotions happen. But that's what Jesus came and died for. So when you and I make sometimes dumb emotional decisions, we do stuff that we shouldn't do and we're like, you know, you ever done something you shouldn't do and you're like, I don't even know how it happened. You just got caught up. That's what Jesus died for. Because he's like, I know, I know. You, you're, you're a mess, I got it. So I'm gonna take your mess on me on the cross so that you can be forgiven and wash white as snow when you repent. You can say, God, I don't know why I did what I did, but I did it. Please forgive me. And guess what he does? He doesn't look at you and berate you. He doesn't do what some of us do as parents. And I told you so. And lecture us. <laughs> That's what we want to do. Kid comes to repent and then you wonder why they never want to come to you and repent again. Because we're not acting like Jesus. You know what Jesus does? He says, I got you. It's almost like he snuggles up with us and says, hey, it's going to be okay. I know. I forgive you, though. I forgive you. Let's just try again. 
Let's just try again. I know you were trying to learn how to ride your bike and you fell. Let's just try again. Just get up. Let's try again. I know it hurt. I know what you did hurt. Let's try again. Why? Because he's not just the God of a second chance. As Pastor Steve has said forever, he's the God of another chance. So maybe you're in here or you're watching at any of our campuses or online and you say, I need another chance with God. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me. If you're in here, say, preacher, I've compromised standards. I, I'm living in sin. I have something. And I just, first and foremost, maybe you've not given your life to Jesus because, so you don't even know what the standard is because you've never come to Jesus. And you say, today I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. But maybe you've given him your life before and you've kind of compromised that away and now you're not serving him. And you say, I need to recommit my life to Jesus. <laughs> Or maybe you're just in a place where you say, preacher, I don't know if I'm right with God and I don't want to leave today not knowing that I'm right with him. So if that's you and you're in here, you're watching in any camps, wherever you're at, you say, preacher, I want to meet Jesus today. I want to ask him to be my Lord, to be my savior, to come into my life, to help me, to forgive me of my sin and to give me a fresh start. If that's you, wherever you're at and if you're one of those places, you say, I want to give my life to Jesus. If you would, right where you're at, just raise your hand. If there's anybody else that says, man, I need that forgiveness from heaven. I need God to forgive me. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Is there anybody else that says, preacher, would you just include me in your prayer that I can make heaven my home and Jesus my Lord? Thank you. If you raise your hand, I'm gonna ask that you would do me a favor. I'm gonna ask that you would repeat this prayer after me aloud so you can hear your own voice. More importantly, I'm gonna ask that you believe it in your heart. For those of you that Jesus is already your Lord and Savior, if you would also pray this in support of those who raise their hand. If everybody would say, Father, I come to you now seeking salvation. So right now, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord, that you sent him to die on the cross for my sin and that you raised him from the grave. So Jesus I give you my life. I ask that you forgive me of my sin. That you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me and guide me in all your ways and in all your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.